Hello, I'm Jacob Kruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay Podcast. This week, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to share with you a clip from our most recent Thursday Night Writes. I think with the holidays coming up, this is actually the most valuable thing I can share with you as far as keeping your writing on track during a period that is absolute hell for writers. So I hope you enjoy and keep on writing. I realized I've been doing this wrong for 17 years. For 17 years on January 1st, I talk about my screenwriting challenge and how the holidays are held for writers and how to get your engine going again. And that's completely backwards. I need to talk about how to keep your engine from stopping because it is a hundred times harder to get your engine going again than it is to just keep it running. Um, <laughs> I used to have this shed, I remember in my backyard, uh, I yeah, Megan's car is up on blocks, right? Even if it's up on blocks, Megan, we still got to start that engine, right? From time to time, or it gets worse and worse. And Mary's needs oil, right? So when I was a kid, we had this shed in our backyard. Um, and this was probably, I was maybe 13 years old, so like 1987, but nobody had been in that shed since like 1980, right? And the truth was, I was afraid to go in that shed. In fact, my whole family was afraid to go in that shed. My mom was afraid to go in that shed, right? It, there was nothing in that shed. There were some old bicycles, a lawnmower, you know, some rakes, right? There's nothing exciting, spiders, exactly. But the shed was scary because we hadn't been in there for so long, right? And this is exactly what happens to writers when they let that engine stop, right? When, when you stop going into the shed, right? The shed gets scarier and scarier and scarier and scarier. Um, and, and, and there are a lot of reasons it gets scarier. Um, one of the reasons it gets scarier is just the unknown, right? Hey, can I even get in that shed again? If I get in there, am I gonna find anything good or is everything gonna be ruined, right? Um, do I even have the courage to, to open the door to the shed, right? Uh, no, Jamie, there's nothing exciting in that shed. Uh, <laughs> but, but your shed has something exciting. Um, so one of the reasons you get afraid is just like, you haven't been in there for a while and you don't know what's in there. And when you don't know what's in there, it's a little scary. Um, the second thing is you kind of know that whatever is in there isn't in as good shape as when you shut the door a couple months ago, right? So if you're writing on a consistent basis, it's like having really, you know, well-oiled, sharp tools, right? But you leave them in the shed and, you know, they got cobwebs all over them and they're kind of gross and, you know, the, the blades are dull and things squeak, right? That didn't used to squeak. Um, and, and the same thing that happens to your tools in the shed is what happens to your skills as a writer, right? When you're using them every day, it's like if you run every day, taking a jog is easy, right? If you haven't run for six months, taking a jog, you think you're going to freaking die, right? And so the most important thing to remember is you got to keep going into the shed. You got to keep going into the shed no matter what is going on in your life. Right. Because, and if you haven't been in the shed, then you got to summon up the courage because every single day that you wait to go into that shed, every single day that you wait, the shed gets scarier. The shed will never stop being scary. Right. But it will get scarier the longer you stay out of it. Your imagination will be able to imagine more horror there, right? Just like Jaws when you can't see Jaws is a lot scarier than Jaws when you see the shark, right? We are terrified of what we can't see. That's where our imagination runs wild. So if you've been ducking this, if you've been going, eh, you know, in the new year, when I set my new year's resolution, you know, when I have time, right? When my kids are grown up, uh, when I retire, when, um, when I have more money, when I have less responsibility, when I hit this next step in my career, right? If you've been putting it um, off 
for any good reason. And Margarita, I don't even think of them as excuses. I think of them as good reasons, right? Uh, mo most writers have very good reasons not to write, right? They have completely rational reasons not to write. Um, it's not rational to be a writer. It's not a rational decision, right? If you were a rational person, you would be an accountant, right? Being a writer is crazy, right? And, and the reason you're doing it, if you're like me, Tammy's tapping her heart. That's right. The reason you're doing it is because if you don't do it, you are not fully you. The reason you're doing it is because there's something in you that needs to do it. Needs to do it badly enough that while a bunch of people are zoning out to reality shows right now, you're here with me on a Thursday night going, how do I do this, right? You showed up. There's something driving you. There's something that matters. So rationally, it's all the rational reasons to wait are rational. They're not bullshit excuses. They're rational. But we can't come from the rational place. because the act that we're taking is not a rational act. It's not based on rationality. It's based on need. It's based on, I need to do this. And by the way, if you don't need to do this, don't. If, if you don't need to be a writer, go find something that you need that badly. Because everybody deserves to have that kind of purpose in their lives, right? Everybody deserves to have that kind of meaning. So if you don't need it, go find something you need. But if you do need it, then you're going to have to find a way to do it, whether that's rational or not, whether you have time or not, whether it's the right time or not, you're going to have to find a way to do it. So step one is finding a way to open the door, right? We got to find a way to open the door and we got to find a way to step inside. Um, and you do what you need to be. I love that, Ron. Thanks for sharing that. Do what you need to be. Yeah. So, um, I, Gemma, I hope I, I hope I'm that teacher for you. Um, in the same way, if I'm not that teacher for you, go find that teacher because you deserve that teacher. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Number one, we're going to decide to go in that door. We're not going to decide to go in that door tomorrow. We're not going to decide to go in that door when it's convenient. We're going to decide to go in that door now, which means we have to find a way to make it safe enough to go into that door. Because if we don't make it safe enough, we're not going to do it, right? Not because we're bad people, not because we're wimps, not because we lack discipline, right? All these things that writers tell themselves. Um, we're not going to do it because we have a self-preservation thing going on and we have a part of our brain that feels under threat and that part of the brain is programmed to protect you. And that part of the brain doesn't actually know that there's not a freaking tiger in that shed. So we need to make going into the shed safe enough that you can do it. Um, the main reason we don't feel safe enough going into the shed is because of the cruel part of us. We don't feel safe enough going to the shed because we know if we go into the shed, the cruel part of us is going to go, you fucked that up. You're not very good at this. You suck. You don't have what it takes. Look how bad your writing is, right? Does everybody have that? If you don't have that, um, you, you're, you're very lucky. But most of us have that, right? To different degrees. Right? Some of us, it is an incessant groan, right? You suck, you suck, you suck, you suck, you suck. Some of us mostly feel good about ourselves, but every once in a while, that little doubt gets in the way. Um, and what's really both beautiful and sad is that that part's actually trying to protect you, right? It, it's trying to protect you from losing your vision of yourself as an artist, right? And it's trying to protect you from putting something out there that gets you hurt, right? It, it's trying to protect you. It has good intentions, but it has a really negative way of going about it. And so 
we need to, if we're going to go into that shed, we need to make it safe from ourselves. So how do you make it safe from yourself? Um, the first thing is you got to kind of make a promise of yourself to withhold your judgment. Um, you got to make a promise to yourself because you know when you go into that shed, if you haven't been in there for a while, your tools are going to be rusty, right? You're not going to be as good of a writer as you were when you were writing every day. And so step one, yeah, Jay, even before you desensitize yourself, um, there's a very fine line between desensitizing and re-traumatizing, right? So before we work on des desensitizing, also, I don't really want you desensitized. Uh, I actually want you emotionally charged, right? And so the 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 first step, we just got to make it safe, right? Um, and, and how do we make it safe? So we got to make an agreement with ourselves that's very simple, which is we're only going to look for the beauty we're going to accept that our tools are going to be rusty. A lot of our writing is going to suck. A lot of the things, there's going to be struggle. Things that used to be easy are going to feel a little hard. But we're going to kind of make an agreement with ourselves. We're only going to look for the beauty. We don't only have to look for the beauty forever, right? Eventually, we can start to look for what's broken too. But until we feel safe going into that shed on a consistent basis, we have to make an agreement with ourselves to look for the beauty. Does that make sense to y'all? Does anybody feel like they couldn't do that for themselves? I just want to make sure, right? Because a lot of people will nod their heads and go, yes, and then beat the crap out of themselves. Does anybody feel like I'm not willing or I'm not able or I don't even think that's a good idea to only look for the beauty. Does anyone have any fears or resistance to that? Thank you, Jerry. Jerry doesn't know if he can do it. Jerry, would you mind sharing with us what the fear is around that? Um, it's so old. The original yeah. impulse is over 40 years old. Yes. And it at it, a creative writing class with Harry Cruz, mm -hmm. and it frightened me so much digging into that that um, I st stuck it away for years and years. I, I became a advertising copywriter just so I could you know write, but yeah. I was hiding from the scary shit, yeah, you know, the scars. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jerry. I, I had a similar experience. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the real trauma, but I'll tell you about. I didn't get into, I tried, I applied at Dartmouth College. I applied to a creative writing class four semesters in a row and I did not get in. And I finally, uh, I finally called, asked for a meeting with the teacher and I sat down with her and I said, I just, I need to know what you don't like about my writing so that I can fix it because um, I want to be a writer and I can't get into your class. And she said, I'll just apply again. And I applied again and I got in. But throughout the class, she was always very nice, but I knew she didn't like my writing, right? I knew she didn't believe in me. I knew I was only there because, because she felt bad because I had asked, right? And that, that had a real effect on my confidence in the same way it did on yours, Jerry. Um, I, and what I realize now is that that writing teacher had no fucking idea how to teach right? Um, she, was, she was a wonderful writer. She was a successful novelist, but she had no idea how to teach, right? She didn't know how to bring out the talent of somebody who, whose writing wasn't in her taste, right? Um, but we all know I did okay as a writer, right? Um, it's easy to allow other people's judgments, right, to get in our way, especially if they resonate with some existing beliefs about ourselves, right? And so there's a, there's a technique that you can use, Jerry, that I wish somebody had taught me, because I went through, if I, 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 
I went through such a crisis of confidence. Like when I teach you guys how to defeat writer's block, I am not preaching from the pedestal, man. I, I almost destroyed my career because of writer's block, right? I was, I was so blocked for such a long time. Uh, and, and everything that I'm sharing with you, I had to learn in order to help myself um, and in order to help myself recover as an artist. So um, part of it, Jerry, and anybody who, who struggles with looking for the beauty is to recognize that those intrusive thoughts are going to come up, right? That the negative thoughts are going to come up. You're going to have that you suck thought. You're going to hear that teacher's stupid thing that they said to you when you were 18 years old, right? You're going to hear that come up, right? And one of the mistakes we make is trying to fight those voices, right? Trying to go like, no, 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 right? And fighting them actually makes the voice stronger, right? Um, what you want to do instead when you hear that voice, uh, or even it might sound like your own voice, it's not actually your own voice, but it might sound like your own voice. Uh, when you hear a voice saying something shitty to you in your own head, what you actually want to do is you just want to notice that and you want to go, huh, isn't that interesting? Huh, isn't that interesting? Right? Huh, that's that voice again. Right? And I'm doing some Buddhist shit with you guys right now, but right, what we're actually doing is we're becoming the observer of the voice instead of being connected to the voice. The second thing you can do is you can allow the negative voice to become a positive trigger, a reminder that you have to find two beautiful things. So every time that voice gives you one negative, you have to find two genuinely beautiful things. Um, and so it stops having such a negative connotation. It feels more like someone going like, oh yeah, remember Jerry? You got to find two beautiful things. Now, it's also possible, Jerry, because this is so old for you, that the word beautiful might be problematic right? It might actually, right now, we want to get you to a point where it's easy, but it might be that right now, actually looking at anything you wrote and saying that's beautiful might be too hard, right? Because it might just be too hard to see yourself as beautiful. Um, and if that's where you are, that's okay. You don't have to stay there, right? You can be there for right now. And if you just do these techniques, it will change. Um, so if it's too hard to label anything beautiful, you can ask yourself, what feels true? Uh, if it's too hard to say that something feels true, you can ask yourself, what feels specific? If it's too hard to label something specific, you could ask yourself, what could be built on? What could easily become something more specific or more true, right? And so in that way, what you're doing is these, all, these questions all lead to the same place. What we're trying to do, what we're going to do, is we're going to take your eyes, which right now, if you're like most people in the universe, are focused on all the things that are broken, and we're going to divert them and retrain them that every time they find that negative thing, they got to shift over and look harder for the positive thing. And it doesn't have to be hugely positive. It can be mildly positive, right? But what this is going to do, when you show a writer who's super confident something broken, they go, oh, cool, that's broken. I'll fix it. But when you show a writer who's not super confident something broken, which is only 98% of writers, right? Uh, if you show a writer something, who, someone who's not confident something broken, they either go, <laughs> right? Or they crumble. Whereas if you show a writer, hey, this can be built on, 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 this is specific, this is specific, this is true, this is true. Pretty soon they will naturally start to link those things together and go, oh, let me do more of that. Um, in dog training, they call this um, positive reinforcement training. <laughs> right? Uh, it also works with children. And it also works with every human being in the fucking world, <laughs> right? Uh, 
if you show people what is good about themselves, if you show people what is good about their writing, they will figure the rest out. If you show people what is wrong about themselves, they will either fight or they will get caught in a rut. They're either going to fight themselves or they're going to fight you. So we want to practice that reorientation. Adam, fantastic. So you know you need a treat, right? Okay. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to limit how long we have to spend in the shed. Okay. So step one, I'm going to tat them in so you guys remember. You're going to write them down so you remember, so you can review this when your crazy little subconscious mind goes, you shouldn't go in that shed. Don't go in that shed, right? You're going to go, okay, I have to go back to my list. Okay. Number one, you are going to, we're going to call it two for one. Every time you have a negative thought about your writing, you're going to have to look carefully for two positive ones. And by the way, you can't bullshit yourself, right? Right? If you feel ugly, you can't look in the mirror and go, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. It's not going to work, even if you're gorgeous, right? Uh, but you can go, I like my left nostril. It's a cool nostril, I guess, right? And uh, hmm. I mean, I got reasonable eyebrows, right? Uh, so you can't bullshit, right? This is not a mantra, right? Mantras don't really work because we can feel the gap between what we're saying and what the truth is that we believe, even if it's not true, right? So you have to get really good at looking, even if it's like noticing your left nostril, right? Even if it's a little tiny thing that, that you're looking at. Um, Allison, notice I did not say it's important to write every day. Um, I can't write every day. Do you know anybody who has a reasonable life, who does any job every day, right? Um, it's overwhelming to think of doing anything every day. And Allison, if you're like most people, I'm guessing that you don't have like limitless money and all the time in the world, that you probably actually have a day job, right? Maybe a family, right? Other shit on top of your writing. And so what a lot of writers do is they punish themselves, right? Often because we come from unsupportive families or supportive in the wrong way families. Not all of us. I was very lucky. I have the only Jewish mother in the history of Jewish mothers who found out her daughter was going to be a doctor and said, but you could have been an opera singer, right? I was very lucky. So not all of us have that. Um, I still ended up with writer's luck, right? But um, a lot of us come from families that tried to protect us from the arts, right? or we're just downright unsupportive of the fact that we were artists, not the desire, but the fact that that's who we were, right? And so we end up internalizing that, right? And we go, well, if you really wanted to be a writer, I guess you would be able to work your 80 hour a week job and write every day and raise your children, right? And have a social, right? We, we internalize that, that negative thinking. So what we're gonna do instead is we're actually gonna limit how much time you have to spend in the shed. What we're gonna do is, we're going to give you, if you're scared of the shed, seven minutes you have to stay in the shed. And you don't have to stay in the shed every day. You can decide, I'm going to go to that shed three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to go to that shed Tuesday afternoon and Saturday after, right? Um, what we're looking for is a consistent schedule. The more consistent it is, the faster the fear will go away. The more sporadic it is, the fear will still go away. If you write once a day, I, I paint once a week. I paint every Thursday, right? That's not as much as I would like to paint, right? Um, and it's a little scary every Thursday, right? Because I'm not doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm not doing it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It, it's scary, but it's less scary than if I didn't have a specific day. Does that make sense? I know every Thursday I'm showing up. So it's actually better to show up in seven minute increments four or five days a week than it is to show up for two hours one day a week if you have fear, right? Because the consistency makes it better. If seven minutes, by the way, is too much for you, 
make it five minutes. Five minutes too much for you, make it three minutes. Seven minutes is the number that works for me. The next thing that we're gonna do is there's a specific number of pages you have to write in your seven minutes. Uh, for right now, since you're all beginning, if you take my Write Your Screenplay class, we do a much more detailed version of this. But for right now, for all of you, the number is half a page. And I don't care if it's a big page, a small page, screenplay format, not screenplay format, half a page. You don't get to leave the room until you've written half a page. You don't get to leave the shed until you've written half a page. It can be a bad page. It can be an awful page. It can be the worst page you've ever written. It can be word vomit, but you don't get to leave the shed until you've written that half a page. If you're rewriting, you can rewrite your half a page from yesterday if you want, but you're gonna rewrite it from a blank page so that you know you wrote another half a page. Does that make sense? Um, Deborah, you're chaining yourself to the desk, but only for seven minutes, right? Which means you're not going to use these seven minutes to think. You're going to use these seven minutes to write. Does that make sense? Just like I was working with David, these seven minutes are about your first instance. If you don't have a practice right now, then I don't care if you're working on one project or 82 projects. I don't care if you come with a different idea. I don't care if you never rewrite. Right now, we just want to make the shed a safe place to hang out. And then eventually, it'll actually become a nice place to hang out. And then eventually, it'll become a place you don't ever want to leave. Right? So we got to make it safe. Uh, yes, Jerry, I am stealing like crazy. This is my version of Julia Cameron. Absolutely. Uh, Julia Cameron is a goddess. She is one of the greatest uh, teachers of creativity to ever live. And her book, The Artist's Way, will change your life. Um, it's also an overwhelming book. Um, it's overwhelming because she gives you so many exercises that you can't do them all. And then you end up feeling bad about that. So, um, so I'm actually dumbing down Julia Cameron for you all to make it impossible to fail. So step one is two, four, one. Step two is seven minutes. Step three is half a page. Step four, so you see what we're doing, right? We're making it safe. We're protecting ourselves from ourselves. If you have a negative thought, you don't get to beat yourself up for having a negative thought, right? You don't get to be, God damn it, you suck. I can't believe you just tore yourself down, right? No, you don't get to play that game. You get to go, huh, isn't that interesting? There's that negative thought. Oh, that's right. That's a clue that I have to look for two things that work. Seven minutes, half a page. Here's the last thing that we're going to do. When you have completed your half a page and your seven minutes, you can choose to stay or go. But either staying or going has the exact same value. If you wrote your half a page, go. You're done. You did your job. If you feel like hanging out, hang out, write more. But anything you do beyond that seven minutes is gravy. And it's really important that you be tough with yourself on this. Not tough with yourself on staying. Tough with yourself on going when you need to go. Remember, the goal is to make the shed safe, right? Um, well, since we're talking about dog training, uh, anybody else do this? You call your dog in uh, to give him a treat, and then you realize he doesn't want to come in for the treat because he realizes every time you bring him in for the treat, you also leave, right? You don't want to play that game with yourself in the shed. Does that make sense? Um, you, exactly, Jamie. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. You got to know when to fold them. But folding them, you still got to do your seven minutes and your half a page. If you fold them, then you did your job. You get to go home. And I promise you, if you do these four things, if you take right your screenplay, you'll get more things. But if you do these four things, eventually seven minutes turns into 14 minutes. Eventually 14 minutes turns into an hour. Eventually, an hour turns into half a day. And it happens naturally. 
but you have to keep doing the process. You have to keep doing it that way or it doesn't work. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So we're going to do a writing exercise today. Um, team, we're only going to do part one of the exercise because my uh, my lecture ran a little longer than I, than I planned. Um, we're going to do the part for yourselves. So we got the holidays coming up. Um, if you ever had a shed, the holidays make the shed worse, right? Um, and if there was ever a time that you need to keep the engine going, it's now, right? It's Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, right? Whatever you celebrate, right? It's family coming in. It's all the beauty and all the old triggers of being around your family, right? It's holiday shopping. It's holiday parties right? It's way too many hangovers, right? It's, it's all, it's beautiful times with your family. It's nostalgia of childhood. It's all this stuff all wrapped up. It's your crazy uncle, right? And it's football on Thursday, right? It's all these things all together, all at the same time. And you need to keep yourself working over the holidays. And that begins by really getting specific with your calendar and setting specific goals that you actually know you can do. That might mean going, I usually write on Thursdays or usually I paint on Thursdays, right? Um, I might not choose to paint on the Thursday of Thanksgiving because it's not gonna fucking happen, right? So rather than fail, I might just go, you know, this week I'm painting on Friday or I'm painting on Wednesday. Does that make sense? But you want to make sure, ideally at least two, at the minimum that you have one touchstone a week where you're doing it, right? So that you don't have to restart the engine in the new year, right? Because restarting the engine, going back into the shed is harder than just keeping on going in. You want to keep the spiders out. Okay. So here is what we're going to do. I want you each to set a goal for your writing, not the, not the New Year's resolution that you're going to set on November 1st. I want you guys to set a goal for what are you going to achieve by January 1st? I think I said September. What are you going to achieve by January 1st? Not the New Year's resolution. What are you going to have achieved in your writing by January 1st? Um, and what we're going to do, I want you all to write it down, but I also want you to chat it in. What are you going to achieve by January 1st. Holy crap, Brooke, four shorts. It's a big goal. Finish one short. Great, Nick. Complete your first draft. Great, finish a draft. First issue dialogue. Bringing back to morning journaling. Wonderful, Margarita. A final draft. Make a presentable draft. Great, attack a third draft. Great. Um, and Steve, um, how will you know when you properly attacked it, right? I want you to turn that into a tangible goal, right? So that, you know, if you spend one day attacking it, is that attacking it? That's your choice. But I want you to have a tangible goal so you know. Um, Breland, see that 75 to 100%? That is a place where you're going to get tripped up. Um, because if you write 75%, you're going to feel like a failure, right? If you're going to write 77%, you might still feel like a failure. So I would rather see you go, if 75% is enough, then I want you to write 75%, right? If 75% isn't enough, then I want you to set a goal that you know actually is enough. And the other thing is, I want you to define for yourself what 75% is. Because yes, your final draft, 75% is probably about 75 pages. But in an early draft, 75% might be 200 pages, right? Because sometimes our early drafts are fat. So, um, okay. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to write 30 pages of my first draft. Great. Uh, on the screenplay, I'm working on with Christian. And I'm going to write something from my heart three days a week. Beautiful. I absolutely love that goal, Jerry. Do you see how specific Jerry's goal is? Love it. Finish my finale reader draft. Great, Adam. Pin down a one-page pitch. Great. Clear out the spiders from my short film in any capacity. Andy, I want you to choose what capacity you're going to do it. I'm going to find someone in Madagascar to help you with me with presenting historical culture. Great. 
Incorporate it into at least three scenes. I love it. These are amazing goals. Write a short, cast it, and plan a time to shoot it. Amazing, Martin. Um, that, it's ambitious, right? It's already November. We got the holidays coming up. Can you really get it cast or is it the beginning of casting? You might want to ask yourself, is it a reasonable goal? So if you have an unreasonable goal, and by unreasonable, I don't mean it's impossible. I mean, it's not 100% guaranteed you're going to achieve it. I want you to break it down into smaller goals. In fact, let's do that right now. I want you to look at your goal. Think about how much time you have between now and January 1st. Think about all the holiday stuff that's going to happen. And I want you to ask yourself, do I know 100% I can achieve it? You can't chat in your smaller goal. Great. Kristen, how will you know when you know them inside and out? I was in a relationship for six years. I'm not sure if I knew her or she knew me inside and out, right? So how do you know? How do you know when you'll know them inside and out? I want you to make that tangible so that you can know when you've achieved it. Reach 40 pages. Great. Um, of a short film written and shot from pre to post-production. Intense goal, Kevin. But if you have if you have the experience and you know you can deliver that, great. Um, Okay, great. Uh, 52 days left. Great. Rewrite 10 pages. Great. Um, <laughs> Jesse, everyone's dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to bring it to the next step now. I want you to write down what are the five biggest obstacles that are likely to get in the way of you achieving this goal? What are the five big obstacles? Write them down for yourself and then you can chat them in. Yeah. And Sarah, yourself, get specific. What about yourself? Right? It's not all of you. There's a part of you that's a writer. Right? So we want to be fear. Great. Homework, fear, laziness. By the way, the idea of laziness is bullshit. Um, at the very beginning of my career, I used to work as an SAT tutor. Right? And moms used to call me up and they go, ah, he's a lazy kid. And then two weeks later, they'd be like, he's studying his, your, his vocabulary. What did you do? Did you wave a magic wand? What did you do to my child? And I'd be like, yeah, I let him think he could succeed. Um, very few people are actually lazy. Are you lazy about checking Facebook? Probably not, right? It, it, it's, it's usually not laziness. It's usually either a re reaction to fear or it's a reaction to feeling like you cannot succeed, right? That makes people flatten their desires into, into what we translate as laziness. Great. Um, great. Uh, time management, commitment phobic, great. Changing jobs, emotional ambushes, great. Um, indecision about what project to tackle next. Um, working full-time plus part-time, unhealthy life habits, ADHD, great. Attached to quicker forms of dopamine, great. Energy levels, great. This is awesome. And do you notice that we share them, right? These are not unique, right? We share these feelings. Okay. Everyone's got their five biggest obstacles. Okay. Here's what you're going to do now. What support or infrastructure do you need to build for yourself to assure that you achieve these goals by January 1st? We're, the obstacles are not going to go away. The obstacles are there that is part of life. In fact, not only are the obstacles you're planning there, there are going to be obstacles you didn't even see coming. So what support or infrastructure do you need for yourself to make sure you achieve these goals by January 1st? Great. And I want you to get really specific, Adam. Take time off from work. Ignore my phone, social media. Great. How much time, which days? When are you going to ignore your phone? Nobody ignores their phone 24-7, and we can't, right? So I want you to get really specific and make sure that your plan is going to work. Great. Mary, what specifically are you going to ask your kids and husband to do, right? Um, Reread what you've written. Great. Like-minded people, writing buddies. Great. I need my staff positions filled. Great. Yes, sometimes you got to do stuff that's not related to writing to build the time for your writing. Absolutely. 
right? Get up earlier. Great, Tammy. How much earlier? Maybe just seven minutes. Um, make an announcement to your family about your goal. Beautiful. Tell your family you need the basement to yourself. These times, these days, wonderful, Jerry. Schedule specific working hours. Set a day when you can pick an idea, brainstorm, and choose what it's going to look like. Awesome. Does anybody doubt that the support ideas that they have are things that they can do? Does anybody like, this is what I need to do, but I'm not sure if I can actually do it. Does everybody have a plan that you know you can do? Okay, great. Um, no, Jerry, what, what's your concern? Uh, that I'll fall off, that something will get in my way. We're trying to get our son back into college and that I'll get overly focused on what he needs, what they need, and not on what I need. Cool. I know a good guy if you want to email me who who does college admissions stuff and 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 SAT stuff. But um uh the uh great. You have a priority with your son. So here's what I want you to think about, Jerry. I want you to look at your goal. I want you to remember that the priority is getting your son into college, right? And that is a reasonable priority. And I want you to adjust your goal in a way that you know you can still get your son into college and achieve your goal, right? So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build a support system for ourselves that allows us to achieve the goals we set. And sometimes that's about re realizing that our priority right now needs to be something other than writing, right? Um, that doesn't mean you don't write. You still need to keep going into the shed. Right. But it might mean that right now you don't get to live in the shed as much as you'd like to. That right now there's another piece of infrastructure you need to build in your life that's more important. So, how can you go into the shed just enough to keep the, the spiders out, to keep the machinery sharp? Right. And if you do that, what you'll find is that you'll actually have more energy to devote to your son, your friend your job, right? Because when you fill that piece in yourself that needs to be filled, right? You are a writer, right? When you show up and do the thing you want to be as someone so beautifully chatted in, right? When you do that, it fills you, right? And when you are full, you have so much more to give to everybody else. And when you are not full, when you are not full of yourself, it doesn't just affect you, right? It affects everything that re resonates out from you. So I'm off next week. You're going to have Christian and a fabulous guest. Um, uh, I'll be back the week after. The week after that, we've got Pitch Festivus. But I want you to really make sure you're achieving your goals, Right. I want you to start this process now before Thanksgiving. So you got that background for yourself. So you've got that, that rhythm for yourself. And I want you to make sure you keep it going through the holidays and that you give yourself the support that you need to keep those tools sharp and keep yourself going into the shed. Thank you guys all so much for spending this hour with me. And uh, uh, I will see you in two weeks. <laughs>